Thanks so much for coming out tonight. My name is Melody Chrislock. I am the Public Water Now Communications Director, and I'm standing in for George Riley tonight. He is at a family event that was really important. So, you still can't hear me? Okay, wait a minute. Maybe I should use. Is this better? Yes. Okay, I'll use this instead. <laughs> I won't start over again. <laughs> but anyway, Melody Crislock, Public Community Water Communications Director, standing in for George Riley tonight. So, I want to say a few words about some of what you've been experiencing in your mailbox and on TV lately before I turn it over to Mary Ann and his team. So, these flyers, you have to know, like, I think six of them have come out in the last 10 days. Each one of those costs about $20,000. The TV ads cost a lot more, and we can't figure out where that money is coming from except our pockets. Yeah. So this is really a travesty. I want to address a couple of their major claims right now. First of all, the $1 billion claim that they rolled out last week. This is <clears throat> absolutely pie in the sky. There's no way. American water is worth $1 billion. That is absolutely just a scare tactic to get us to say, oh, we can't afford this, no way. In Felton, they started in 2008 when they did the Felton buyout, they started at $46 million. They ended up paying 13. I mean, you know, Felton paid 13 when Calam had originally asked for 46 million. And that seems to be a pretty typical pattern for Calam is asking for maybe three times what they start, what they expect to get. So keep that in mind when you see the $1 billion figure. And the other thing about this is this government takeover nonsense. Measure J requires, if you pass this, Measure J will do this. It requires the Water Management District to do a feasibility study within nine months if it's found to be financially feasible and in the public interest, then they would pursue a buyout of cal -Am. This is an if and only if situation. If it were really worth a billion dollars, everything stops right there. No buyout. We could never afford that. If cal -Am really believed it was worth a billion dollars, they wouldn't be so worried about this feasibility study. So, <clears throat> they're protesting awfully loudly here. So I want you to remember that, if and only if financially feasible, does this go forward. It's a safeguard, it's a legal safeguard in a public utility buyout that this has to have a feasibility study. So the other thing they've been doing is trashing the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District who would become the new owner if there was a public buyout. They have been saying things, the last flyer I think said, no new water. That's a lie. MPWOD has been responsible as of next year when the recycled water project that they have helped develop goes online, they will have been either responsible or co-responsible for developing 7,300 acre feet of water. We only use 9,400 acre feet. By next year, they will have been responsible for two thirds of our water. That's hardly nothing. So this is, this is something you hear repeated over and over again by certain special interest groups trying to defeat this for their own private reasons. So, this government takeover stuff, this is a local public agency. It's no more a government takeover than the fact that our schools, our police department, our fire departments, those are all publicly owned government agencies. This is government small g, local government with the people that live here, that are elected by us, making the decisions that are answerable to us. Hardly what government takeover means. They've also been trumpeting their D 
desal permit from the CPUC. <coughs> that permit is only the first of four. They need three more permits to start building that desal plant. Marina Coast, I mean Marina Water, City Marina, they need one from the Coastal Commission and they need one from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. So they have quite a hurdle yet, quite a few hurdles to get over before they can really start building that. They have no water rights. The entire situation that they're trying to promote in Marina is completely off the charts. They want to take, I hope all of you realize they're not taking ocean water. What they're doing is taking brackish groundwater from Marina's groundwater resources to desalinate brackish groundwater. It will cost us a lot of money because they have to put some of that water back into the aquifer because it's already an overdrafted basin. So this scheme would, as the Monterey Herald and Land Watch has pointed out recently, if they could build this desal, it would double our water costs. So everybody here probably already knows that we have the most expensive water in the country. Right, we really want to double that, don't we? There are better solutions to our water situation that were presented to the CPUC a couple weeks ago. They ignored them in favor of Cal-Am's plan, and now we'll see what happens. They're likely to be sued and stopped. So this is really the track record of Cal-Am. What they do is over and over again, they start projects that don't come through, but in the end, we have to pay for them. We're already paying for $34 million in failed water projects over the years from cal -Am. plus $64 million for the water we didn't use because we all conserved. It just, it goes on and on, and it's a major argument for why we really want public ownership and local control of our water. Really, all of those flyers are meant to do one thing, distract you from the fact that we have the most expensive water in the country, that cal -Am's costs are going to go nothing but this way, and that we have no say and no choice in what cal -Am does. It's really that simple. Just remember those issues and make your decision based on that. So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ankin and um, hold your questions till the end, if you would, and then we'll um, take time to answer those with the rest of his team. And I think you'll really find what he has to say fascinating. I certainly have. John. between uh, Monterey and Missoula is that both systems have been privately owned for over 100 years. Well, was privately owned. They're no longer privately owned. So. Well, thank, thank you very much. It's lovely to see this many folks out on a Monday evening. Uh, we typically have our city council meetings every Monday, and I'm avoiding that tonight. So thank you <laughs> for having us. Uh, it's our second visit to Monterey, and, and uh, every time it just gets better, and we stay a little bit longer each time, uh, and we're grateful for the opportunity. So I'm not here to tell you how you ought to do your business here in Monterey, California. That's entirely up to you. What we're here to do is tell you our story tell you what happened in Missoula, Montana, and you can draw from that what you will um, and make your decisions for yourselves. So I'm going to uh, read for a moment, which I don't usually do, um, but uh, it's a long story. I want to make sure I capture everything, <coughs> pardon me, as succinctly as possible, and I'll have a few additional remarks. We're very casual in Missoula. Uh, so if you can't hear me, you're welcome to yell at me. Um, if you can't see me, you need to visit an optometrist immediately. Uh, we were at the uh, we were at the aquarium uh, yesterday, uh, and some Greenpeace people tried to push me back in the water, ladies and gentlemen. It, it kind of became an issue, and I'd like to talk with some of you about that later. But first, let's do this. The epic battle 
for ownership of Missoula's water began quietly in 2010 when Mountain Water and Carlisle Infrastructure Partners uh, visited my office to make the city aware that the system long owned and operated uh, by a fellow named Sam Wheeler, who made his home right here in California, had been sold to Carlisle, a multi-billion dollar investment group based in Washington, D.C. The city of Missoula had been keenly interested in ownership of that water system for decades. Of the 129 cities incorporated in Montana, 128 owned and operated their water systems for the benefit of the public. The city knew through filings with Montana Public Service Commission and conversations over the years with Mountain Water Management that the system was suffering from deferred maintenance uh, and that deferment over the years uh, had left the system leaking about half of the water it pumped. That's four billion gallons a year were pumped and never reached an end user. We also knew that Missoulians were paying more for water than folks in other cities where the water supply was in municipal hands. And we speculated based on the filings at the Public Service Commission that lots of money could go into repairing and maintaining the system and that money was currently going into the pockets of a private owner. The interest in owning the water system was so keen that in the 1980s, uh, one of my predecessors, Mayor John Toole, initiated condemnation proceedings under state law in an effort to force Mr. Wheeler, who owned two other systems in California, to sell mountain water to the city of Missoula. That effort, controversial at the time, failed in courts, and Mr. Wheeler continued to own and operate the system until 2010, and after being courted by Carlisle, he sold all three of the systems for about $150 million. Based on Mr. Wheeler's animus toward the city of Missoula, uh, in the wake of that failed condemnation effort, it was clear that the city would never be able to purchase the system from the Wheeler family uh, or his heirs while they owned it. When Carlisle bought the system, however, a door opened. Shortly after, uh, Robert Dove, a director with Carlisle Infrastructure Partners, met with me in 2010, we began conversations about a negotiated sale of that system to the city. And based on those discussions with Dove, it became clear that Carlisle was much more interested in the favorable regulatory and financial environment in California and the value of the two systems there, here, than it was in Mountain Water, which was really an outlier, both geographically and in terms of long-term profitability. Dove, we think, also recognized that the politics of water ownership in Missoula, Montana, particularly Missoula, were complex. The Carlisle deal required the approval of the Montana Public Service Commission, and that approval required community support. So Dove and I made a deal. The city would support the sale in exchange for a chance to purchase the system when, inevitably, Carlisle would put it on the market. We signed a letter agreement uh, to that effect, and the sale was approved and finalized in 2011. We began negotiations in earnest in 2013 by bringing together a team of experts to help us prepare an offer, place a value on the system. That offer, which was $65 million, was tendered in a letter to Dove that year, and Carlisle's response was <clears throat> that it did not intend to sell Mountain Water loan, and that even if it did, our offer was too low. Based on all the information that we've gathered about the system, about its condition, the potential for Carlisle flipping the company to another buyer with similar philosophies around extracting as much profit as possible from the system without reinvesting, and what had become my fundamental belief that an essential ingredient of life <clears throat> pardon me, shouldn't be in the hands of faraway investors driven only by self-interest. We elected to pursue purchase of the system through the courts. We exercised our right of condemnation provided by Montana law. We filed suit and we went to court through two years of motions, briefs, and trials 
the city of Missoula prevailed. We won the right to purchase the system for $88.6 million, based on the simple notion that it was more necessary for the benefit of the public for the city to own the system. In the meantime, while we were fighting it out in court, Carlisle did what we knew they would do at some point. It sold Mountain Water and its system, sister systems to a Canadian company without the knowledge of the Public Service Commission in Montana, the courts who were adjudicating this case, or the city of Missoula. The price tag for the system they purchased for $150 million in 2010 was $327 million. Over the course of a very few years, Carlisle flipped the system in the dark of night for a windfall. That confirmed our suspicion that they were never long-term owners and never operating with the best interests of the citizens of Missoula at heart. On June 15th of 2017, after all the legal wrangling was done, or I should say most of it, the city of Missoula took possession of Missoula Water and began operating it in the interest of its new owners, our citizens. Today we do everything we promised we would do. We hired Mountain Water employees to operate the system. Knowing that with appropriate resources, planning, and expectations, they'd take care of the customers and begin the process of repairing the system. We began paying the loan, our mortgage, to purchase the system and we committed to make the repairs necessary to bring Missoula Water to an acceptable industry standard. And we are doing all of that today. We're paying the mortgage, we're operating the system, and we're investi investing in its future without raising rates or using property taxes. In the rearview mirror, one of my favorite places to look. <laughs> it's become only more evident that the city of Missoula was in the midst of a creeping crisis, a slow emergency that left unaddressed would lead to huge rate increases, a catastrophic failure of the system, the possible exporting of our precious, <coughs> pardon me, our precious water, and an uncertain future. Our actions, which were not uncontroversial, put an end to that emergency. If we had not pursued acquisition with rigor, confidence, and speed, I'd have been negligent, irresponsible, and ultimately a leader who had failed his community in a time of trouble. We're going to give you some information about how we're operating that water system today, but I can tell you from what I've seen on the ground thus far here in Monterey is that uh, the bag of tricks ain't new. It's stuff we've seen before, and it's really based on fear and not based on information fact. And you shouldn't be afraid. You should learn as much as you possibly can. Now in Missoula, Montana, we don't have everything right. And if you Google me, you might find that I don't have a 100% fan base. <laughs> if I did, I'd be in trouble for a variety of other reasons, I suspect, but the fact of the matter is that, uh, that nobody's perfect. Uh, however, this, is, uh, this was absolutely necessary to the health and well-being of our community today and for generations to come. And while some of our circumstances are different, the fact of the matter is that I would much rather have the essential element of life in the hands of a neighbor I have elected who is accountable to me than I would an investor who doesn't know where the hell on the planet Missoula, Montana is, but for the fact that it's a cash cow. You have an opportunity here, and Measure J really is an opportunity to learn more. And what you will find, I suspect, is what we found. There is a lot that you don't know, there is a lot that regulators don't know, and that there is a lot of opportunity for you to control your water destiny in a way that you all can afford. Measure J is a way, it's a step. And frankly, it's a much less expensive step than the one we took. We learned all this through discovery. 
We paid attorneys and fought with attorneys through courts of law to get the information that we believe we needed to make good decisions. You have an opportunity to do that in a way that's, we think, simpler, probably cleaner, and maybe more effective. That's the opportunity before you. And I hope you take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, glad to see that our arrival um, has already generated a piece of literature I was handed tonight. If I read it correctly, I'm actually going to use the uh, movie trailer voice or the political ad voice. The truth about Missoula's water. <laughs> Did the city of Missoula win in court? This says no, I say yes. How do I define a win? By winning. <laughs> We wanted to pay 65 million bucks, we ended up paying 88.6 million bucks. It's okay. Not the ideal outcome, but it's okay. Because in the long term, that 88.6 million dollars is cheap. The reality of city legal bills in Missoula, the city claimed legal fees would be $400,000. Actually, the mayor said that in a public meeting. I can't do math, apparently. We had an estimate of what legal fees would be negotiated uh, uh, based on a negotiated sale. It wasn't a negotiated sale. Carlisle did everything in his power to make the legal battle as expensive as possible, and it got expensive. About nine million bucks, ladies and gentlemen, and we'd do it all over. The city lost. The city lost an additional ruling on capital improvements. Yeah, sorta. We're okay with it. Turns out we're still making capital improvements. The city's total bill, 118 million. It's about right. Comparing Missoula to Monterey, and we got no seals. <laughs> Relatively otter-free zone. We do have deer. We also had water systems that were corporately owned, and corporations do what they do in the interest of their investors. Publicly owned utilities do what they do in the interests of ratepayers, consumers, citizens, and future generations. Uh, Never mind that the water rates in Missoula remain as high as ever under public ownership. Our water rates today are the rates that folks were paying in 2011. Uh, Carlisle was asking for 5% rate increases year over year for the length of their ownership. Liberty was going to do the same thing. We'll raise rates, guarantee it. When it happens, It'll be 12 people who are looking their friends and neighbors in the eye who are also paying the bill. And they'll be raising those rates to ensure the health of that system and the welfare of the community. That's the truth about the new water. So with me this evening are uh, Tasha Jones, who is one of our attorneys and a brilliant one at that, and Dale Bickle, who's the Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Missoula. Uh, Dale is a recovering accountant, but I rely on him uh, for uh, those accounting skills that he still remembers. Dale's going to trot through sort of the, the, the state of the system today and hit you with some numbers, um, and those numbers uh, are pretty tough to refute because we can show you the bills, uh, and uh, we can show you the checks. So Dale, if you'd like to step up and trot through our PowerPoint technology. And I'm just gonna talk about, I mean, there's a lot of specific information on Closer. these slides that, are, um, that aren't particularly relevant, and I won't actually read all of it, but I just wanted, there's some things that are of interest that I think that uh, you will find here. So, um, and this, this is just some statistics on the system. We have uh, 34 employees 
uh, in our water utility, um, all of them came from mountain water. We, we made a promise to um, um, make them whole through the transition, and so we, they, they maintain the same salaries and benefits. We value their, we hired independent uh, um, actuaries to value their benefits and ensure that, um, that they would be made whole through that process. Um, I won't read a lot of the items related to uh, the water system um, itself. You know, we're a, a, a town of 70,000 people. We have about 23,000 connections. Um, um, I think the statistics the, the, I would like to uh, throw out there, there is in the mains. We have 326 miles of mains, um, and about a third of which are over 50 years old. So the system continues to leak more water today than, um, than it delivers. Um, but we are going to do a leak test this fall and see how much uh, our, our water main work has, has accomplished. Um, this is the organization. I think um, it's important to note, and, and the mayor mentioned it, that you know now 129 cities in Montana operate their systems, and most of their cities operate it in a manner like this. It is a department within the city of Missoula. It is in our public works department. What also in our public works department is also our wastewater treatment plant, our stormwater utility, um, our streets division. Um, these things and, and and water. I mean, it's 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 complicated. It's hard, but we have the expertise to do it. And and cities do complicated things all the time. We run a police force. We run a we run fire. Um, and and you know our public works director is an engineer who has utility who is an expert in utilities. It is the ordinary course of business that municipalities uh, run these water utilities. Um, what's not listed on the organization chart here is uh, is um, the mayor as the CEO of the city or his board of directors, which are all the local um, elected council. Uh, this is just a snapshot of our first year of capital improvements. Um, no, we're doing. Um, about six and a half million dollars of of, um, of of cap of cap X um, last year. Um, uh, some of the projects that we listed, uh, four thousand uh, three hundred fifty feet of of uh, main replacements, um, and uh, so uh, it is job one of the water utility to uh, try to uh, get that leak rate down and and bring, get this um, utility closer and closer to. Uh, industry standards. Um, I'm going to get into the numbers. I, I mean, you know, the numbers are important and in the form of financing. We issued a, a, a revenue uh, bond anticipation note. That is a, it, it is a short-term loan in anticipation of a longer takeout. Because of the cloud of litigation, it was our best course of action to be able to get a rate uh, I mean, it's still a really favorable interest rate, uh, but at a, at a time um, when we, rather than borrow money before we had an operating history, it allowed us um, to get control of the system, um, uh, make sure how our numbers were um, working through our performa, and um, be able to do a long-term takeout after that, which we were uh, planning to do in the, in the, in the next uh, six months or so. Um, so just one thing about the a revenue bond, and this is typical uh, for uh, um, municipalities um, across the country under rates. The, you know, the, the bond issue is solely secured by revenues of the water system. The, the property taxes, the general credit of the city of Missoula isn't at, placed at risk. It is, solely, um, it is solely secured by the system revenue, so it has no effect on property taxes. There's no pledge of the general credit of the city. Um, similar financing that we use in our wastewater utilities. Um, it doesn't, you know, the, the water utility doesn't impact the, the, our general fund credit or our general obligation credit. Um, here's the numbers, um, and it was it was expensive. Um, the mayor is right. Um, purchase price. This is this is the purchase prices related to our ultimate settlement with Liberty Utilities. Um, Eighty-seven point eight million dollars uh, there for the acquisition. Um, we paid uh, 3.9 million in defendant legal and condemnation. We're also required to pay those other, the other side of that. Uh, post valuation improvements of 3.2 million dollars that were listed in the flyer are are improvements that um, that Mountain Water made subsequent to uh, the filing of the suit. Um, and then there's city legal and acquisition costs. Now that is, you know, our condemnation costs, but it's also other other experts' transaction costs. Everything is in there. Um, you know, to our total of 104 million. You see some of the other 
um, amounts that came to the to um, included the rest of the uh, capital expenditure reserve. Um, you know, in case something happened during the system that we had some capital available uh, to work on the system, just the cost of issuance itself. Um, and then we also funded the first three years of capital improvements. Um, you see a $3.8 million there that we borrowed, you know, and you said, well, in that earlier slide it was six and a half million. The rest of that is, is pay as you go. It's cash is being um, generated by the system. Uh, I think one important thing, so, you know, water utilities in general have very good credit ratings. Um, uh, Standard & Poor's rated um, our water utilities credit. This is before we owned the system, um, and, and, and we had an A rating, which is an investment grade, um, very good, stable outcome, um, and that led to um, our ability to get a really favorable interest rate on, on our loan. And so it's, uh, it, you know, right, I think today we are about 3.4% on our loan. Um, water rates. Um, so, um, when, when the, the city council adopted a resolution um, to adopt the 2014 um, water rates leading up to the actual acquisition of the system, but subsequent to that, the Montana Public Service Commission um, imposed a punitive rate deduction, rate reduction on Liberty Utilities of about 6%. Um, and, and during the transition, when we were uh, putting our own billing system up and transitioning off of uh, uh, off of a mountain water system, we use that lower rate. Um, um, but, as, but the way our performance ended up, we were actually, uh, our expenditures were lower than we had expected. Um, based on our performance, we tried to be very conservative. And we are still at that 2,000 million rate. We are authorized to be up 6% higher than we are, uh, but we've been able to manage the system, do our capital um, improvements, and um, make our debt service payments at the, at the 2,000 million rates. Um, so just a couple of statements on our operating model. You know, so adjusted for the municipal environment, um, you know, there are no administrative fees paid to the parent corporation. Um, the, the property is exempt from income and property taxes, and there's no profit sent to parent corporations. All of that stay, all of those dollars now stay in the community for the benefit of the, uh, for the benefit of the, of this utility in the public. Um, so our private, so the current rate structure provides for all current water system employees at their salaries and benefits, provided for the, the preliminary five-year capital plan of nearly $30 million. Um, it's gonna pay a payment in lieu of tax related to property taxes that the system we're paying and, and pay all those legal costs, everything that you saw under that current rate. So that was my last slide, so. I'll give Tasha a quick introduction. Uh, so we had a fantastic team. Uh, we had tremendous support from the community. We had support from uh, the Missoula City Council. Uh, and we had a legal team that I put up against anyone in the United States. Tasha happens to uh, live and work in Missoula, Montana. Uh, and this became a cause for her in the same way it was a cause for us. And she can tell you a little bit about uh, a little bit about the tactics that you're seeing today, uh, and how we responded to those tactics. You're going to hear the same things we heard. You can't afford it. You can't pay for it. You can't run it. You're going to raise taxes. It's going to be terrible. Tasha, is it terrible? <laughs> Uh, comparing Missoula to Monterey, um, one of the ways that uh, we are like you is that uh, Carlisle hired American Waters lawyers. <laughs> yeah, a gentleman by the name of Joe Connor. And Joe Connor brought with him the team of mercenaries that American Water uses all across the United States. Uh, as the experts that came to Missoula and testified in our case. So we fought the same people that are behind the ads that you're seeing. We heard from the same individuals who are telling you that your system is worth one billion dollars. I, lo I love that they called that an appraisal. <laughs> yeah, by MR Valuation. Yeah. His name's Mark Rodriguez. 
He is uh, the same guy that testified in our case and told us that our system was worth $200 million and we could never afford it. These folks are American Waters guys. They say what American Water wants you to hear. And their information is not based on facts. That's what we learned in our case. That's what the judge ruled. That's what the Montana Supreme Court affirmed. That's why we own our system today. So here's the truth. They don't want you to look under the hood of the used car that's for sale. They want you to just trust that it's worth too much, that you can never afford it. I don't know what it's going to look like for you, but I can tell you what it looked like for us. Uh, what we found is that uh, there were, there's an authorized rate of return, right? That's supposed to be the authorized profit that the utility earns on your water rates. But that was just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the money that was leaving our community and that was flying away from Montana, first to California and then to Canada. We literally had a PowerPoint slide where we had dollar bills flying from Missoula to, to California and then to Canada. Uh, I love that slide. Uh, it was, it's so true and it, it, it was really shocking and these are things that the, the Montana Public Service never knew about either, right? You know, you take, you think that because this is a regulated utility that those folks who are regulating should know, but they don't. And not only uh, did our evidence show that um, our regulars, regulators didn't know, but our, the sister companies, Apple Valley, Central Valley, uh, your regulators didn't know either. Uh, and, uh, and so there were a whole bunch of tricks that the company uses to maximize their profits and increase the amount that they extract out of our, out of our communities. Um, things like um, service fees, administrative fees. So much so that in Carlisle's short, short ownership, they dividended $12 million straight up the corporate ladder. Uh, there were um, trustee fees, there was travel and entertainment, thousands and thousands of dollars in travel and entertainment. Um, any of your municipal utilities get $40,000, $45,000 for travel and entertainment on their budget? What would you do about that? So, th so what, what, what was happening was there was a literally another set of books. There was huge payments called intercompany receivables being made from Missoula to, to the California parent company. And when we were asked in deposition, what was that money for and where did it go, nobody could answer. <laughs> there was $2 million in uh, administrative services fee that was paid every year to California, to the, to the corporate parent. When asked what did Missoula ratepayers get for those services, nobody could answer. Well, general, corporate governance and oversight. Okay, what does that mean? Nobody knew. The reality is, is all those things were just profit by another name. In a utility that's supposed to be regulated, that caps the profit. Here's the other thing that we learned. When the utility said that they were investing capital in improvements and maintenance, they weren't. They had a very creative uh, definition of what a capital improvement was. And what we found was that they, they in no way were there with their dollars that they were spending on maintenance and improvements sustainable in any fashion. And every year, our system was degrading further and further. The $6 million that was spent by the city of Missoula in the last year, our first year of ownership, that's more capital improvement than the system had received in the last six years under private ownership. That's what we found under the hood. But that was just the tip of the iceberg in the evidence that we presented at, at trial. 
that was just the start. Because it's just not about money. It's about a philosophy. It's about transparency. It's about accountability. It's about stewardship. And in every facet of what is the right thing to do when you're talking about an essential utility, when you have a corporation who's driven purely by remote investors and the money that they need to make a return on their investment, you just can't make the right decisions. Not for the community and not when it comes to an essential thing for life like water. And so that is why we won. That is why American Water doesn't want you to even look under the hood. Right? It, they don't want you to ask questions because the answers are not going to look good for American Water. Be careful about what you're reading in these flyers and, uh, and uh, encourage your neighbors, your friends and neighbors, to be careful about what uh, they're reading there too. Because what the truth revealed for us is that there's only one right owner for something like water, and it's us, it's all of us. I'm trying to encourage her to run for mayor, by the way. <laughs> seems great. Yeah, it seems like the right thing to do. Uh, we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, if we don't know the answers, we will make them up. <laughs> uh, and, uh, we're at your disposal. If you happen to be here from Cal Am, or you happen to have a different point of view, nothing wrong with that. Um, the people who work for California American in the same way that the people who work for uh, Mountain Water, uh, they're people and they're doing their jobs. Um, our responsibility was to present information based on the public interest. Those folks have a much different job. And the material you're receiving right now suggests to me as a casual observer from someplace else uh, somebody's afraid of losing something. Yeah. 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 And somebody's afraid of you having something. And so your opportunity here is to understand what you might have and what they're afraid of losing. So that. We're all ears. And if, for the sake of everyone in the audience, if you don't mind moving to one of the microphones, we'd be grateful. Yeah. Uh -oh. Turn the other one. Right, thanks for uh, thanks for your presentation. Very enlightening. Uh, one of the cri uh, criticisms I hear about public ownership is that employees of uh, public agencies have these really cushy uh, retirement benefits, and it's far more costly and not nearly as efficient. <laughs> um, and so I'm just wondering how you worked about water employees. Were they unionized, or are there retirement benefits different? Are they greater? Or is it pretty much pair, uh, comparable to what it was before? Sure. So the, so the promise we made in the beginning is that we would make water employees whole. We didn't want them to be afraid that they would lose their jobs, that they would find themselves uh, working under completely different circumstances, that their lives would change dramatically. What we wanted to do was provide them the resources to do their jobs well. And we believe that the rank and file at Mountain Water uh, were folks who were happy to get up every day and provide service to their community. And that's played out. The promise we made is the promise we kept, and that is we met with each individual employee of Mount Water. We looked at what they were paid uh, on the last day they worked at Mount Water, uh, what their retirement benefits, what their entire benefit package would be, and we negotiated a deal that allowed them to transition to working for a public entity uh, without losing those benefits. So we have a different retirement program, for example, so we had to account, accommodate for that. Uh, but those employees, all but two, all but two employees, uh, two executives,
didn't make the transition, they didn't come to work for the city of Missoula, uh, but everyone else did. Uh, Mountain Water was not organized, they, it was a non-union shop. Uh, we have about 13 bargaining units at the city of Missoula. We're happy to have folks organize if they wish to engage in collective bargaining. These folks are certainly welcome to do that. Uh, but right now they're operating under contracts that we signed individually with those folks for five years to make sure that they were made whole. That was our promise and that's the promise we have. Anything I'm missing? My turn? Hi. Um, what a pleasure it was to spend some hours with you this morning. And one of the, I've got two items here. One of them is that this morning you had mentioned something about the infrastructure where you went, you saw what it was like in this uh, one area where they were supposed to have put in new piping and you looked at it. I wonder if you'd explain that to everybody. And also, uh, what about the taxes? They're so disingenuous when they send out, when cal -Am sends out its uh, literature that, you know, it makes us feel that if they leave, we're not going to have fire, we're not going to have water, we're not going to have, you know, uh, police because they, their taxes pay for everything. Oh, we're gonna lose our schools. So I wonder if you could talk about how disingenuous that statement is. Very well, we, we, can, we can start with the infrastructure and what, what, uh, what Carlisle and Liberty had, had done in advance of our discovery efforts um, was frankly just sort of silly. And Tasha can describe uh, those levels of silliness, I think, with with an eyewitness account. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. So we had to uh, uh, get a court to force them to ha to let us and our experts. Our, we had a team of, of engineers that that came to inspect the system. And uh, you know, this is a system that is that is very old, and we we all knew that. Uh, but when we received when we arrived with our experts at some of these. Uh, well houses, the pipes were wrapped in brand new shiny sheet metal. <laughs> Clearly it had just happened. Literally like there was paint on the walls that it was, you, if I touched it I would have had wet paint on my hands. So there had been an, an effort literally in the hours before, uh, the days and hours before our experts came to inspect the system to cover up what it was really like. Uh, we had a mountain water employee that was our tour guide, and uh, and these these folks again, they're local guys. They they they're really they were just doing their job. They admitted to us right there that um, no, usually we just paint paint the the pipes to to handle uh, things like rust, but they wanted us to cover them in sheet metal this time this year. Uh, we had to get an, uh, the the court to allow us to unwrap take off the shiny sheet metal, and what did we find underneath? Decrepit, rusting, horrible infrastructure that had no investment whatsoever. That's what was under the shiny sheet metal. Uh, that's the evidence that was important to us um, at trial that showed there had been an utter lack of investment in our community. Missoula, we call that putting lipstick on a pig. <laughs> uh, so, so with regard to property taxes, Mountain Water, Mountain Water was a property taxpayer. Uh, and our commitment to the community was that we would make those property tax payments in lieu because a municipality is exempt from property taxes. We would make those payments to jurisdictions to ensure that they weren't in a sudden deficit by virtue of the fact that we had acquired the system and we're, we will phase out um, those property tax payments over time but uh, but frankly uh, the money you're the, the money you're getting is actually your money right so so you're getting your money back in the form of property taxes and I can tell you it is the most expensive money you'll ever pay yourself back. I wanted to say something about that claim too of the six million dollars. If you read that carefully it says that they pay six million dollars in taxes, comma, some of it goes to schools, etc. 
We know for a fact that in 2016, they paid $5 million in corporate taxes. And corporate taxes don't do anything here. They fly off to New Jersey. So there's not a lot of money left in there, probably, that goes to anything local. Certainly nothing like $6 million. We know $5 million of it doesn't. Hello. Um, so you're the fourth group that's come to talk at the PWN forum, and you're the only one that actually got into eminent domain. Um, and I understood that that thing called discovery is a very frightening thing for corporate water companies. I wonder if you could um, speculate why, why why was yours different than these other three who settled on the settled on the courtroom steps uh, rather than face into the domain. You want to try that one, Kasha? You know, I, I, I don't know that we were that different. Um, I think that um, we had uh, a uh, we had an adversary that was relying on a, a, a plan that they use all across the United States. And so we really weren't that different. Um, we, we faced the same lawyers uh, uh, that American Water hires across the country, the same experts that American Water hires across the country, the same tactics uh, that you're facing in your own community. Uh, we had full pages ads in our newspaper. We had the threat that uh, we couldn't afford it. It was too expensive, that the legal fees would be too high. Uh, we just persisted. Um, we did that because we had, we had committed city, city leadership, we had a strong city council, we had folks that realized that the money, the dollars that they needed to invest in fighting this fight was important for generations to come. Um, and we pursued it till the, till the end until we won. We tried at many, at many times to, to settle and it didn't work out. We were always willing to negotiate um, on a reasonable basis to, to, to see the end of it, that those opportunities didn't present themselves for us in this case. So we had to see it to the end. I think there was an assumption that, uh, that expensive lawyers from somewhere else could open a can of whoop ass on some hillbillies in Montana. <laughs> and it turns out we got a pretty good law school um, and, and a fairly committed, uh, we, we had a fairly committed community. We had evidence on our side, that's a big deal. I'm, I may have missed this, but did you say that you started the, the road towards buying your water uh, by way of council vote, or did you have a public vote? Uh, we had a council vote, yeah. So, and, and some folks had called for a referendum, why, asked the voters whether they want to buy the water system. So I, I was elected uh, about a year ago now to my fourth term. Uh, I ran for office that uh, third term, my math may be off, but, but the number one priority when I was running for office uh, for re-election was the acquisition of the water company and the six city council members who were elected on that cycle, were elected on that cycle ran on that platform as well. They believed that uh, public ownership was a necessity uh, and that was the referendum we believed we needed. We also did uh, a statistically valid poll uh, to understand whether we had the kind of community support we believed we had, uh, and our support numbers were in, in the 70, 70 plus percent. Yeah, the reason I ask you that question, did you, did you eventually have a referendum? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you didn't have to cont contend with the public, the massive blowback public relations campaign that is so expensive for us to try to get the public to vote for a public water system. And uh, so I was going to ask you how you did, how you funded that, and how you engaged against such a big giant as Cal Am is for us, um, against all the money they have to spend on TV ads and all kinds of, of stuff they have to ed educate the public. Yeah, we, 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 we ended up in court pretty quickly, frankly. Um, Missoula City Council, we, we had exhausted our, our 
means of negotiation, uh, and what really was left for us was to pursue condemnation. I asked the Missoula City Council to provide me the authority to pursue that condemnation action. We did that at a public hearing where folks could come down and tell us yay or nay, um, as they often do, and uh, the City Council at that time, with uh, nearly unanimous support, as I recall, uh, said, giddy up. You know, and to add something to that, I think what you're seeing here is an example of community leadership, which we have not had. Our leaders have not stepped up and said, this is a ridiculous water situation, we're going to take charge of this, do something. So they've left it to a group of citizens to basically create the public will to force this issue. They didn't need to do that in Missoula because they have leadership. So I have two questions. First of all, thank you for coming back. I heard you when you made your presentation a couple months or so ago, I guess. Well, a year, year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like yesterday. Because <laughs> I've been to so many of these meetings. Uh, but I have a question. I remember the last time you spoke, you talked again about the discovery that you did in court. Um, and how you found out a lot of information. Do I remember correctly that the total that you discovered that was actually siphoned off from Missoula and went off in the uh, form of these administrative fees and things that they couldn't account for in discovery was close to 90%? Is that the accurate number or did I get it wrong? No, no, I, I don't think it was 90%. It was significant. Um, so uh, we... And Dale, maybe you can remember some of the more specific numbers. So we knew we knew that right off the top, there was a $2 million administrative services fee every year, an annual payment to California. We knew that we could save that. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, the, we, with the help of um, experts, including Dale, we were able to um, look at the, the books, the financial statements of the company, and then create uh, pro formas. What would this look like under municipal ownership? And there were all sorts of savings uh, that, that we were able to, to identify based on uh, the, the, the discovery that we received, where it, under municipal ownership, those dollars simply would, would stay in our community, could be used for other important work like capital uh, improvements, new mains, um, new extensions, new, new fully metering the system, things like that, um, that, that, that needed, needed to happen. So we could take those monies and divert them monies that were being used um, for profit. Okay. It wasn't 90% though. Okay. The other question was uh, tonight when you were talking about the uh, finances for a buying system, it was very hard to hear because you were holding the microphone in a way that it didn't carry. That's and so, Dale's technique. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to listen more carefully, right? So my question is, you said something about because there was litigation that it somehow or other affected the um, I guess the rate at which you were able to borrow. Could you repeat that? Because it just wasn't possible to understand it. Sure, Dale. Uh, yes, I, I think one of the things uh, that we did was we purchased the system with a short-term bond, a, a bond that um, expires in three years. And we did that uh, uh, for two reasons, really. One is that with, with the, the, um, the cloud of litigation, um, having that bond sale, it was going to affect the interest rate. Uh, we, you know, we, 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 while we did get a standard, in, uh, a, a standard employer's uh, rated uh, bond, um, there's still, you know, the, without actually having, um, having the system um, and having some operating history, we didn't want to make a 20 or 25 year decision based on that. If we could get a short term loan, um, then we can we can get some operating history and then go to the market and then and then have that have, have that advantage. The other is the ability to act quickly. Um, you know we you know this was a, a a long process, but the opportunity to uh, settle and be able to get a check out the door quickly was very important. And so when we had the opportunity, we could we had that set up and we could go and we could we could get it done very quickly. So that was the reason. Rather than go through a public a municipal bond sale at that time, which take, which is a long process. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Yeah, so fundamentally, bankers are nervous. 
Uh, and what we, what we needed to do was have some operating history to do the long-term bond. Uh, and we, we, had to, we had to make some guarantees up front and some covenants in order to get the short-term financing, but ultimately we were able to get that. Also note, uh, tonight's hit piece suggests that we uh, used a foreign bank, and I'm assuming uh, foreign is in uh, some sort of evil air quote. Um, we interviewed a variety of banks. There aren't that many who can do deals this large, uh, and, and Barclays presented the best terms for the city of Missoula. So we used that bank because that bank uh, was giving the folks I serve the best deal. So is it your plan that you probably will do a long-term bond at some point? Yes. And that will be what, a few percentage points less than a private bond? Uh, yeah, I, you know, we're, it's a, it'll be a, a, a municipal revenue bond, so it's tax exam, so it ju just that, it, it, uh, just with that it'll be, um, uh, a lower rate than um, than uh, a typical proper uh, lender can get provide. Is there definitely a definitely cheaper thumb? than equity. Is there a rule of thumb like it's usually a couple of percent less than a private bond? Uh, you know, it depends on the creditworthiness of the of the corporation. Um, uh, right now, if we do a non tax exempt bond versus a tax exempt bond, it's a, it's about a percentage difference. Um, and a percentage difference in a in a on a deal like this is is millions and millions of dollars over the term. Of it is important. The uh, rate that we would probably be looking at here would be three to four percent over a thirty to fifty year bond. And what we plan to do as a, as a function of that bond offering is we we will have uh, we'll have denominations of bond that will allow Missoulians, folks we serve, to actually buy a revenue bond and literally own a piece of the water company as well as publicly own a piece of the water company. I like, I, my name is Paul Bruner. I heard you use the word uh, hit piece a second ago, and I just really like if we tone down the violent rhetoric. Just outside here a couple minutes ago, Dan Turner physically encountered a no on J person, bumped him, kicked his items that he had, got in his face, we need to tone it down so there isn't any violence. Fair enough, I appreciate that, sir. No, I just won't get a lot. Also, if you have questions just for Public Water Now or on Major J, feel free to ask those too. Any more questions for, on, on the subject? Got some more. And a question. Um, I just wanted to announce that. Um, oh, it's on. It's on. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in this location next week on Monday at 7 o'clock, the Old Town and Monterey Vista neighborhoods will be conducting a candidates forum and um, you don't have to be residents of those particular neighborhoods to come and uh, we have we are in an election cycle we have two seats on the city council and the mayor's position uh, that are being contested we have a couple of the candidates here tonight and who have come out publicly in favor of P measure J um, others have not and so if you are able to come, um, the format will be filling out questions on the cards that um, and this week you will, will get the most questions. So we encourage you to come and um, direct your questions uh, specifically to the position on Measure J and why um, the candidates take, are, are taking those positions, as well as um, encouraging you for the City councilmen that are not running for re-election right now to get in touch with them and insist that they take a position either for or against, so we know uh, what those positions are and that they can have political consequences. So thank you, and I hope lots of you to see you next week, seven o'clock. Yes. Yeah, so. I appreciate the perspective you've given. Uh, clearly, you're wondering if this is 
the municipality, uh, there's some cohesiveness there. We have a very different situation uh, on the Monterey Peninsula. There's multiple municipalities involved. Uh, clearly, the, uh, you know, Water Board uh, is you know, the entity that's going to have to sort of spearhead uh, all of the efforts that you went through. I'm not sure how that's going to work uh, from the perspective of you know, these multiple cities under you know, sort of this relationship with the Monterey Peninsula and the Water Board. More of a question, really, for the. Does, uh, does everyone here know who represents them on the water board? No. No. Well, you'll find out soon because now this is going to be important. Every one of you has a person who represents you that you've elected. I don't know if you voted for them or just didn't vote and they were your neighbors. Services. We don't see them that often. Right. Well, they will become, if, if this goes the way we think it will, they will become much more important and much more visible. There are five of them that are elected to the Water Management District, and then the 5th District Supervisor, Mary Adams, also sits on that board, and a representative of all the mayors, one of the mayors. So that's how the Water Management District is organized. It has representatives from all the elected from all the different city areas. Obtaining bond issues, uh, do they have that authority? And Absolutely. Can that work? Uh, yeah. Yes, they have the authority to issue bonds. Go ahead. Some questions about the uh, how we're you know, considering negotiating with Calam. It looks like in Missoula, the water system had been sold twice recently before you got involved. Carlisle bought it, and Liberty, I guess, bought it. So uh, there were some willing buyers and sellers. I prefer in the American system that we have willing buyers and sellers. And eminent domain, my understanding is like you're building a huge freeway and someone refuses to sell their little lot to you and it's a public necessity, that you can use eminent domain for, but not when you should have willing buyers and sellers involved. And we shouldn't be using eminent domain frivolously, in my mind, at least in America. This isn't exactly frivolously. I mean, we have the most expensive water in the country, and we are basically being held captive by a huge corporation. American Water is the largest private water provider in the country. Calam is just a subsidiary of that. So when you look at our situation, this is what eminent domain is designed for. But I thought it's supposed to be more like a, a legal Someone is, is, is resisting an emergency situation. Or Alan is building. resisting an emergency situation. <laughs> well, okay, I'd like them to answer that question. There sure. were two willing buyers within a few years of when you decided to get involved. Uh, there was one buyer, and then a subsequent purchase that happened without permission of the Public Service Commission, the regulatory body, right? Uh, and uh, what we had to do was demonstrate necessity. The hill we had to climb in Missoula, Montana was to convince a judge that it was as necessary for the city of Missoula to own that water system as it would be for the Montana Department of Highways or the Federal Transportation Administration to acquire a piece of dirt to drive a highway through. That, that, was, that was the threshold we had to climb, we had to prove that necessity. And because Carlisle, which originally said it would negotiate a sale with us, back out, we didn't think we had an option. So we pursued what we believed was the right course. And the other difference here is this is, this is a monopoly that, you, if, if I could tip up another water system overnight in Missoula, Montana, we would do that. Um, the fact of the matter is you, you can't do that. The, the sunk infrastructure is so expensive uh, that you don't duplicate that system. So we needed to acquire the system on behalf of the public. Montana lawmakers made a specific provision in the law for acquiring water systems through eminent domain, and we believe that was an appropriate, uh, we, we believe that was an appropriate approach. This is commonly used, over 400 public Buyouts of water systems have occurred in the country in the last 20 years. 
think also a little issue on the evaluation of the water system. Uh, when Caldine was going to develop that B-cell, I think it was going to be just almost about $300 million. And I went to a bank and I said, well, let's do a 30-year loan on that at, at one well, for the current rate. And they said it would cost a billion dollars to pay all the interest, pay the principal back, just for the desal plant, not for buying the whole system. So here they just got approval for a desal plant. So let's not underestimate the cost of what we're dealing with. It's so, not a billion dollars. So the, fun, the fundamental difference between public ownership and private ownership is cost. Public ownership is at cost. Private ownership is, is cost plus. Yeah, I'm back, but I just want to clarify a couple things. Uh, for this gentleman, uh, it would be the same in California. The first part of an eminent do domain proceeding is determining that it's in the public interest. And once that's determined, then what's the fair market value is the second part of that process. And I also wanted to go back to the water management district. Uh, Melody mentioned there are five elected seats, and they're every now they've made it every two years. And so it's it's division one and division two if you live in those divisions. Division one is in Seaside uh, majority, and division two is kind of Seaside Del Rey Oaks. Fan City and North Monterey, and George Riley is on that is is running for Division Two, so he could be a swing vote and get a much more favorable uh, water board. So those are the two that are up. The other three, which is uh, PG, Pebble Beach, Carmel, um, and Monterey, the, the southern portion of Monterey, those won't seats won't be up until 2020. You know, in terms of the banking, um, I certainly learned a lot about uh, municipal finance in this process, um, and it, it's really very simple. Uh, if, if, if American Water can afford it, so can you. <laughs> and the reason for that is um, it's, very, it's a very bankable deal when you have a monopoly on the market and you're, you're offering a service that every single person in your community needs and must have in order to live. <laughs> and it's, it's quite simple. And so in, in that scenario, um, you're gonna find that banks are absolutely willing to lend both private entities, like American Water, or municipal governments, like, a, like the collection that you have here, uh, the money to operate that system, because it's a sure bet. It's a sure bet. And, uh, and, and what we were able to do is present that not only is, is, is it bankable, uh, that, that there are banks that will do it um, and, and, are, and want to do it, but that the municipal, the municipal government has access to very reasonable interest rates for, for bonds such as this. And, and so much so that a very small savings on interest can really lead to humongous savings for the community. For us, we showed that the average interest rate for the money that the company was lending to itself at times was around 6.7%, whereas uh, the, uh, the municipal government had access to interest rates in the, in the range of 3 to 4%. And when you're talking about $100 million, that, that adds up really quick. Um, and so uh, if they can afford it, you can afford it, especially when you take all that profit right out of the, out of the balance sheet. Um, it, it becomes really affordable. Um, and bankable at that time. Yes, sir. I, I applaud you on the effort you did for your citizens and your city. Uh, there's some major differences, however, between your scenario and what we have here. You were a municipality that had public works department, you had billing systems, you had everything already in place. The water management district here does not have any of that. They're not a municipality going for bonding. They do have bonding ability, but they have limited experience. In it. That's not or I wanted to actually ask the question. In Montana, with public pensions, are they required to be through a public pension fund so you have no choice as a city of where you have your employee and pensions? In California, it's basically you're with CalPERS, which has large, and every jurisdiction has large unfunded pension liabilities. And in fact, the Water Management District currently, as of 2016, had 4.6 million in unfunded pension liabilities. So, one of the questions earlier about now you have a much larger base coming over, yes, I would hope they would make them whole and exactly as you did, but you're now going into the CalPERS system here. In Montana, how does the 
Yeah. Is there a statewide mandate of certain pension things, and how is Montana's pension system current? Uh, yes, uh, it is, there were required, once they became municipal employees, they were required to participate in the Montana uh, public employee retirement system. Um, there are two tracks to that, and uh, each employee can uh, decide individually how they wanted to do it, either through a 401k style invest in the market or a traditional pension. Um, the, you know, during the recession, Montana wasn't immune to the problems that a lot of, uh, uh, of state pensions have gone through there. Uh, but our legislature actually did a good job. Um, and, and, the, um, and while not completely funded, the, um, the, the public employee retirement system in Montana is, is doing very well. And, and the evidence at trial was that the company's pension had un unfunded pension liability of $6 million. So, you know, the, uh, the public's un unfunded pension liabilities uh, oftentimes is the same as these private companies, and that was the, that was the situation for our folks. And that was a, the California company. So the California company was the one that was handling the employee pensions. My tax dollars on the line with the state's public liability, not the company's. Calam also has employee retirement benefits that we're paying for. It's not like that's a new concept. Um, before we get too much further, I'll, we can take a couple more questions. But I wanted to point out, um, the only way that we can really compete with Calam's probably four or five billion, million dollars in ads is through our volunteer efforts. You've got some of these blue forms. If you can help in any way, if you can phone voters, if you can walk in your neighborhood, even just taking a yard sign and putting it up. All of that helps to move this to a yes vote. And we really need the whole community to take responsibility for this. Public Water Now has initiated this, but we're all in this together. It's all, the water is all of our issue. Hey, okay, Dan, go ahead. Um, my name is Dan Turner, and I called about a month ago and spoke to some folks in this room. So I want to know some of the details of this. And they're speaking to the mayor, actually. Um, I just wanted to say about some of these issues that are raised, uh, which are basically Calam's arguments. A water management district doesn't know how to pump water through pipes. This is not rocket science. We're not sending a man to the moon. We're running water through pipes. People have been doing this for thousands of years. Dave Stolt, who is the general manager of the water management district, is a civil engineer. Uh, Molly Evans, who is uh, one of the directors on the Water Management District is a civil engineer. If we can get rid of Calam, Water District will hire a, probably a civil engineer who has been working for 20 or 30 years managing water districts. It's no problem. All of the employees will move over this phony issue. Now, about the, the, the state retirement system, it's true these people will be in the state retirement system and it will probably cost you one dollar more a year to pay for the state for these folks in the state retirement system for all of them all together and in return for that i don't know how many hundreds of dollars we're going to save as a result of getting rid of calam and having a community-owned water system which would be so much less So my name is Tyler Williamson, and I'm actually going to be one of the candidates that's speaking at the forum here next week, uh, running for a city council here in Monterey. And I'll just share with folks now that won't be able to make it that I am one of the candidates that support um, moving forward with Yes on Measure J because it's an opportunity. For us here. And, and to speak to one of the comments that the gentleman was making, you know, one of the other issues that I'm, I'm running on is housing, but. We know we're not we're not fighting for these things because they're easy. We're fighting for them because it's the right thing to do. And I guarantee you that if Measure J fails in November, that folks, a lot of the folks in this room and a lot of folks in our region aren't going to stop. So let's just move forward with the study. Let's let's let that process happen. And I, I think I, I give a lot of appreciation for you all for coming out here and, and sharing this with us. Um, I think one thing that's needed uh, in politics overall is just more community engagement. What better way for us to be more engaged on one of our most precious assets in the region than 
rallying around our water and folks being more aware. So I, I see a lot of, uh, of folks older than I, and I said, that's just the ER, beautiful people, right? But, but I mean, maybe a great way of, of moving forward with this is trying to get your children or your grandchildren to be a little bit more interested in getting to understand. Have them do like a research project or something that will get them more engaged in the community and have them do. Thank you. So um, we'll stick around if you have other questions, but thank you all for coming up to me. Give your sign. Give your sign for that. All the way with Monterey.